Well, Doxology, hey, great to worship with you today. Whether you're traveling or stationed somewhere or checking out Doxology for the first time or needing to stay home still or maybe even stay home again these days. Uh, we can't wait to see you in person as soon as you're ready or able, but we're really glad you're joining us today. If you've got a Bible uh, this morning, go ahead and grab it and start finding two spots today if you can. We're going to launch from Matthew 6 this morning. It's about three quarters of the way toward the back of your Bible, Matthew 6. We're going to launch from there back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible, so towards the front. If you can hold your place in Matthew 6 and also find Deuteronomy chapter 8, that's where we're going to be today. We've been in this series we've called Getting Out of Airplane Mode. The idea comes from a scene in Jesus' ministry where the people following him finally got the courage to ask him how he was able to live in what seemed like a constant, uninterrupted connection with God all the time. And they couldn't ever get out of airplane mode. I was reading a book uh, just a few weeks ago by Eugene Peterson where he talked about something he would discovered. Here's what he said. He said, people can think correctly and behave rightly and worship politely, but still love badly, live anemically, bored and insipid and trivial lives. Does that ring true for you like it does for me? I mean, isn't that what some of us are trying to figure out even about our Christianity? Like we believe it's true with a capital T. Jesus is a real, verifiable person who lived 2,000 years ago, taught that he was God in flesh, came to rescue us from our sin, was crucified by the Romans and the Jewish leaders, whose followers genuinely believed that they were eyewitnesses of a resurrection. And even more, like I heard one guy say one time, if someone calls their own death and resurrection in three days and pulls it off, you pretty much go with whatever they say. And some of us have decided to do that. We put the weight of our trust in Jesus' death and resurrection to give us forgiveness and life. We're confident that we're going to heaven when we die and have maybe even altered some of our behavior based on his te teaching. So we behave rightly and think correctly and worship politely. I mean, come on, that's us. But if we're honest, we love badly, live anemically. I mean, I love that metaphor. Just a little sluggish, lacking vitality, bored and insipid lives. I mean, honestly, that's the reason some of us know Christians who love so badly, isn't it? I mean, do you know people? It's like they misunderstood the promise of Jesus to say, I've come that you might have life and have it more angrily. You know people like that? What's that about? I don't think it's that they really want to be angry. I think it's that they want to feel something. It's like my kids during the summer, they're bored. So they pick fights and they love badly. You know, that was the disciples' experience too. You see it all through the gospels. They all heard the same sermons and read the same scriptures and walked through the same world. They could quote the verses, keep the rules and sing the songs. But Jesus, had a different gear. Their connection with God felt spotty, like a phone in airplane mode. But not Jesus. He was connected wherever he went. And the disciples kept watching and wondering, how does he do that? Until finally one of them asked him, Lord, teach us to stay connected to God. Lord, teach us to pray. And you remember how Jesus responded? That story's from Luke 11. The words you've learned are in Matthew 6. If you're there, read them out loud with me. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We've said all along in this series, let me say it one more time. If we just treat this prayer as words to say or a prayer to pray, we'll miss the power of what Jesus was given us. In fact, 
it's the opposite of what the disciples were asking for. They weren't just asking for a new mantra for a moment. They were looking for a grid for their whole life. And that's what Jesus gives us. This is Jesus' framework for living a whole connected life. And today I want to talk about the piece of that prayer that at first may seem the least relevant to you. But I believe, and I think I can prove this, the fact that it seems the least relevant is an indication that it may be the most important. And in fact, I'll go a step further. I'm totally convinced that the number one reason that most of us find ourselves living bored, anemic, airplane mode lives with Jesus is that we've organized our life and our hopes and our dreams and even our prayers in order to make sure that this prayer, this part of this prayer, never feels relevant to us. Let me say it this way. The life that we've asked for may be keeping us from the life that we long for. Let me show you. Here are the words that help frame part of how Jesus teaches us to live out of airplane mode. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Jesus says, give us today our daily bread. Now, the redundance of the word day makes that feel totally irrelevant to our lives, doesn't it? Well, we could get down with it if Jesus had just taught us to pray, give us our daily bread. Provide us so that we have food to sustain us day after day. I mean, we've got today covered, most of us, or we could. But the future isn't guaranteed, and we get that. So it makes sense that we would ask for that. It's not urgent, but it's important. Give us our daily bread. That connects. Or if he'd said, give us today our bread. That could work. I mean, I don't need bread for today, but I realize there's a connection between what I do today or accomplish today and my bread, so to speak, for tomorrow. That could be relevant. Give us today our daily bread isn't a necessary prayer for almost any of us, is it? And we recognize how it might be for some people in some places of the world. The prayer feels relevant for them as it is. We might need to change it if we were to pray it. Give them this day their daily bread. That could work. But in a world of refrigerators and walk-in pantries and HEB, it doesn't feel like we need this one anymore. And we're right. If bread is just about breakfast. But it's not. And the disciples knew it from the moment Jesus said it. Have you ever had one of those moments? You ever notice how sometimes you hear a line or a phrase and it instantly brings a scene and a whole story to mind? So, if, for example, if I were to say, one small step for man, what instantly comes to the picture in your mind? Right, the moon. But not just the moon, I bet you see a scene Two people, you see how they're dressed. You see what they're holding. And if you've done much reading, you know a whole backstory to their story. Okay, what if I said, I have a dream. You see a scene, don't you? Okay, what do you see? What's he wearing? Yeah, he's wearing a suit. What color is the suit? Black suit, black tie, isn't that crazy? Four words, and we all see the same scene. Even if we weren't there, we know a bunch of the backstory and the meaning and the lessons of the scene that we see. Okay, same thing happened with these words for these guys. They didn't have the video, so the colors may have been different, but when Jesus said, give us today our daily bread, all 11 of Jesus' disciples saw the same scene they'd heard about and pictured in their mind a thousand times. Their ancestors had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. God miraculously set them free, led them across the Red Sea with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. The sea closes on their enemies and they find themselves free in the wilderness, more free than they'd ever been, 
with more needs than they'd ever known. Their stomachs start rumbling. They get hangry and they go to Moses and Moses goes to God and God says, here's what I'm going to do. Remember this story? Every moment when they wake up, they're going to look outside of their tents and find bread for the day and only the day. In fact, God told him, if you can gather, if you do gather more than you can eat for the day, it's going to get worms and maggots and stink. With one exception, on the sixth day, I want you to gather enough for the sixth and seventh day so you get a day off. And that's exactly what God did. Check this out. For 40 years worth of days. Okay, now think about that. 40 years? That's long enough to find them a field and dig them some irrigation ditches and grow them some wheat and make them some bread. 40 years is long enough to build them a Costco in the wilderness, right? 40 years is a long time. And not only that, he could have just dumped a week's worth of manna on Sunday, right? Get your miracle on Sunday, live off it the rest of the week. He could have done that. He didn't do that. For 40 years, he gave them each day their daily bread. Why? Do you still have Deuteronomy 8 open in your Bible? Look down at Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in verse 2. Moses is speaking. He says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years? Why? To humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna which neither you or your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, not just about breakfast, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes didn't wear out. Your feet didn't swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Notice what Moses tells these people. Why did God give them each day their daily bread? Their Father in heaven gave them daily provision to discipline them, to live towards his daily plan, to trust in his daily promises as daily preparation for the life he was leading them to. You see that? That's what discipline is. Discipline is different from punishment. Punishment is about prevention. Discipline is about preparation. And Moses said, God has been preparing you. Your heavenly father daily gave you daily bread for 40 years so that you would groove into your life and your routine from the moment you wake up every day expecting this was going to be a day where God would show up again with exactly what you need. Forty years of that, six days a week, 12,520 days of the same routine. Okay, what is it Malcolm Gladwell says? You need 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. They had 300,480 hours of practice, depending, expecting, and thanking God for daily bread. And Moses says every single one of those hours was preparation. Preparation for what? We'll keep reading verse 6. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land with brooks and streams and deep streams, springs gushing out into the valleys and the hills. A land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey. A land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. You see what Moses says? He says, someday... You're going to find yourself in a land where when you wake up in the morning, your first conscious thought is not going to have to be, give us today our daily bread. You're going to have toppings for your bread and fillings for your bread. You're going to have so much bread that some of you are going to choose to stop eating bread because it makes you gain weight. 
give us this day our daily bread will feel like an unnecessary, irrelevant prayer. And in that day, in that place, in that world, in that reality, when you live in the life that you've asked for, God goes on, look down at verse 11. Be careful. Everybody say, be careful. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, His decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You hear what he's saying? The bread wasn't ever just about breakfast. Daily bread was always about discipline. Be careful, Israelites. Don't forget be prepared, stay disciplined, because when you live in the land you've been asking for, it can keep you from the life that you're longing for. The experience of abundance can become the enemy of abundance if you forget the discipline of dependence. And I wonder today, if you don't mind me asking, is it possible that that's happened to us? If our everyday lives feel so disconnected from God, because for the most part, we've arranged our whole life to not need Him for anything except to let us into heaven when we die. A declaration of daily dependence on Him, give us today our daily bread, feels totally irrelevant to us because we haven't been careful. We haven't remembered. We've forgotten to stay disciplined. So what do we do? We sell our fine homes and flocks and stocks and forsake all abundance to renew our dependence on Him? Maybe. But probably not. That wasn't the solution that God gave the Israelites. He doesn't say, I'm leading you into this land of abundance so you can feel guilty and ashamed and walk away from it all and go back to the wilderness again. That's not what he wants for them. That's not the application for them. He simply says, be careful. Stay disciplined. Don't forget. Don't let abundance make dependence and irrelevance. So the question is, how do I do that? Well, notice what Moses said back in Deuteronomy chapter 8. The 40 years of practice, 300,480 hours of discipline have grooved some expert level rhythms of dependence into your soul. Don't let the rhythms go away just because the need for them doesn't feel as urgent as it did. What are the rhythms? Well, I think there are three really obvious ones, and all three of them are present in the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Here's the first one. A daily declaration of dependence. A daily declaration of dependence. Jesus said, give us today our daily bread. Pray that. Okay, remember the scene. Remember the setting. That was a grooved in declaration of dependence for them every single day before they even got out of bed. Like a first conscious thought, God, it's today again. I'm hungry again. I'm dependent again for daily bread again. And I need you to have shown up again today. Until boom, they moved into the promised land, the land of abundance. First morning, wake up in Canaan. What do you think the Israelite is reflexively going to do in that first morning? Lord, it's today again. Oh, yeah. But remember, the presence of abundance doesn't change the need for dependence. It just changes the application, right? So Jesus is saying, don't forget the discipline just because it's got a different application. 
Okay, so we looked at the scene in Deuteronomy chapter 8. There's another passage Jesus probably had in mind as well as he's inviting us to declare our daily dependence on God. It's a prayer written in Proverbs chapter 30. A guy named Agur, he says this in Proverbs chapter 30, beginning in verse 8. He says, Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. You hear what he's praying? He says, Lord, never, ever let me get to a place where I have a need that you don't meet. That's a pretty easy to pray, prayer to pray, isn't it? I mean, all of us pray some version of that. But the breathtaking part of what he prays, the un-American part, is the second half. He says, Lord, never let me get to a place where my abundance outpaces my dependence. Give me abundance, Lord but never so much that I'm tempted to forget my dependence on you. I wonder if you trust, I wonder if I trust the hand of my heavenly father to pray that kind of prayer. Lord, never let me have a single day without some moment of my life where I find myself totally dependent on you. What would happen if we lived that way? You know what I bet would happen? I bet we'd find ourselves disciplined in the second rhythm too. A daily discipline of dependence. And the second thing is everyday expectation of provision. Jesus says, give us today our daily bread. You know, I think of waking up on Christmas morning when I was young and your eyes come open you realize what day it is, you go running down the stairs and wake the house up because you've been here before and you haven't seen anything yet, but you're certain he's been here again, right? Now we grow out of some of that magic of that illustration, but this one's better. Imagine waking up every single day for 40 years, stomach growling. I know what that means because I've been here before. And before you even open the door to the tent, you're thinking, <laughs> I bet he did it again. See, when you live on the razor's edge of daily dependence on God, you know what starts to happen? You begin to wake up in the morning and expect him to show up every day. And in the land of abundance, it's not always bread. Sometimes it's a conversation or an opportunity or a need or some wisdom. It's all kinds of currency and all kinds of blessings. But when you live there every day, you learn to expect it every day. The application changes, but the expectation doesn't. When you discipline yourself to stay there. What if we disciplined ourselves to stay there? What if we woke up in the morning our first conscious thought was to ask God for a fresh encounter with him on that day. Lord, give me this day my daily bread. I don't want to live on yesterday's blessings. I don't just want to live on your promise to my parents. That was God's invitation to the Israelites. Israelite grandparents and parents and teenagers and kids, everybody depends on everyday bread. And after you ask for it, you look for it, experience it for a while before long, you begin to expect it. And after 10,000 hours of depending, experiencing, who knows? Malcolm Gladwell says you're going to become an expert expector. The last piece is this. Daily declaration of dependence, everyday expectation of provision, and instinctively grateful generosity. And before you just write this off as a preacher, doing a preacher thing and making the money turn, notice that guilted into giving generously would have been a far better alliteration, but the preacher intentionally avoided it. I have zero desire to make you feel guilty today. And I'm really not just talking about your money anyway. I could just as easily be talking about mints. More on that in a second. But notice, this comes at the end for a reason. I mean, think about your life. And for a second, take church and money out of the mix. Think about the reason people aren't generous in general. Not when we're guilty, when we even want to be. 
Isn't it true? Whether we're talking about time or influence or expertise or gifts or money, the reason we aren't generous, even if we want to be, is that we don't believe we have enough of whatever it is. So we can guilt someone into giving, but we'll never guilt them into generosity because when we live in a scarcity economy, we always have to wait to make sure we have what we need before we're willing to give any more than what we're required. Does that make sense? But notice Jesus' prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Notice it's not just a prayer for me. It's a prayer for we. And there are words that show you the scene. Remember, new full bucket every single day. We declare our dependence daily. We learn to be experts at expecting. And before long, what happens? The expectation doesn't turn into entitlement. It turns into gratitude. And in fact, expectant gratitude. You know, this is where the whole idea of a tithe comes from in the very beginning. It was 10% of what you gathered off the top. You gave it first. That was the rhythm of the discipline. Why? Because you're an expert expector who daily declares your dependence. And at some point you lived in the world of dependent abundance and expectation for so long, you're able to be generous off the top before you have anything in your belly because you know God's going to fill your bucket. So look, no guilt. You're not obligated to tithe. You're under grace. There is no guilt to give or to be generous. But with your heavenly Father and His hallowed name and the will and the kingdom that He's bringing on earth and inviting you to live in, I don't know why a person wouldn't who's living like Jesus showed us how to live. Because grateful generosity becomes the instinct of a person who's in the rhythm of requesting and expecting God to daily give them daily bread. Last week I was at the grocery store, standing in line behind a family, a dad and four young kids. And I overheard the oldest dad ask his dad, Dad, can I have a mint? Dad reached in his pocket, pulled out a mint, handed it to his son. The kid reached down and handed the mint to his little brother. Then he asked again, Dad, do you have another mint? Dad pulls him in out, kid pulls it, hands it down to his little sister. And the third time, dad can have another mint. Dad pulls out a mint, hands it to the kid, kid hands it to his other brother. And I thought, what a cool kid. So I just decided to encourage him. I said, man, that was incredibly generous. You are such a great big brother. This kid, I I bet he was 10, looks over at me, gets over kind of close to me like he's letting me in on a big secret. He whispered, he's got more. Isn't that awesome? He's like, hey man, I think I could get you one too if you want. I mean, I'm playing with house mints here and there's plenty to go around. He's got more. Come on, isn't that what Jesus is inviting us into as well? Not just with mints, not just with money, not just with manna, with our whole life. It's instinct to be generous when you've lived dependent enough, long enough, to expect it. Heard a guy say one time, it's not a prosperity gospel. It's not a poverty gospel. It's a provision gospel. Your father, he's got more. Give us this day our daily bread. Maybe more relevant than we think. What if we disciplined ourselves to live this way, even in a place of abundance, to intentionally place ourselves in position to declare our dependence on God, watch Him work, to the point that we learn to be expert expectors and live lives that are overflowing with grateful generosity wherever we go. Be careful here. Stay disciplined here. Don't forget here. Don't settle for a bored, anemic, trivial life. Don't let the life you've asked for keep you from the life you long for with a father who's always got more. Would you bow your head with me? 
Father, would you let us remember? Would you let us stay disciplined? And even in a place of abundance, would you let us stay dependent? Would you allow us to be expectant every single day and let the blessings in our lives and to our lives overflow from our lives everywhere we go? Lord, give us today our daily bread. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you wanna see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.